Ah, someone's got a very noisy microphone. Ross, I think. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. All right, so everybody, welcome to um, the Sunday afternoon tie time call. Uh, about three of us are here on the island in Thailand, and everybody else is uh, spread around. Uh, it's, it mostly, you, this is a call for the UK, so it's for late Sunday morning. And uh, today, we're going to start with the concept of hard times, bad times, a hard day. Guess what? Days are just days. They're not hard. What's hard is that we don't like something. But that's what makes it hard. Uh, the times themselves are not hard. In fact, the Chinese would call it interesting times. OK, but yeah, there's a few wars going on, but there's always been a few wars going on. We've had some we've got some really crazy politicians, but we've always had crazy politicians. In fact, being a politician is actually craziness is a requirement. Nobody in their right mind would be a politician. Which makes politics kind of crazy. But not hard. Hard is your own personal attitude about things. And I welcome you to change your attitude. And in fact, that's really what the teaching of the Buddha is all about, is to change our attitude. That when we say something is hard, what that actually means is, is that you feel like that you're a victim to something. Something is hard, something is heavy, some weight that you have to carry. And I invite you to just set it down. Whatever it is is hard, whatever it is is heavy, especially if you don't have it actually in your hand. In other words, whatever problem you've got, if it's more than three feet away from you, it doesn't belong to you anyway. So you're often carrying burdens that don't belong to you. In a way, uh, being worried about politics is kind of a theft. You're a thief. You're taking problems that don't belong to you, bringing them home, and then feeling bad. Partly because we want things to be different than they are. And things are not going to be different than they are because you want them to be different than they are. So we can change that immediately once we figure out that it doesn't belong to me. Just set it down. And we might pick it up later and then we'll think it's hard again. Well, if you can see that it's hard again, you can remember, oh, I set it down once. I can set it down again. And we keep putting things down, keep setting things down over and over again. Then we're more careful when we pick them up again. And so that's actually the teaching of the Buddha. Now, uh, one question that is often raised about that is the idea of progress, making progress on the path of, of Dhamma. And that um, this is very typical of the Western mindset, that if we are um, victims, if we find things heavy, if um, we have burdens to carry, we want to ask, well, how long do I have to carry this burden? What kind of progress towards a goal am I making so that I can finally set this stuff down? There is a story called Pilgrim's Progress. It comes out of the Middle Ages, Dark Ages, or something like that, where pilgrims are people who are on a spiritual journey going uh, to a holy site. 
And so I'm, I ask the question, what happens to a pilgrim when he finally reaches the holy site? Is he still a pilgrim? Well, he's been a pilgrim all of this journey. He's made progress. He's gotten closer and closer and finally arrived to the holy place. Does he then change his attitude? Wow, I'm in a holy place. No, the pilgrims of those times actually would only spend the time to rest at the holy place and then they'd get up and pilgrim themselves into going to some other holy site. So the question is, why do we keep going when we have already arrived? This is what we mean by progress, that actually um, much of the practice of, of meditation is with the idea of making progress. Oh, I can see this dukkha and I can see that dukkha. Maybe I'll see some more dukkha. And when I've seen enough dukkha, then I can be free of it. Well, guess what? That doesn't happen. Another word that we could use for this would be ambition. And so we want this, we want that. We're ambitious to go get this and go get that. And guess what? When we get what we want, when we get the uh, the results of our ambition, guess what? The ambition doesn't go away. The pilgrim remains a pilgrim because he's been in the habit of being a pilgrim. So whenever the pilgrim actually arrives at the holy site, he's still a pilgrim. He's not now a holy man living in a holy site. He's still a pilgrim. So what does he do? He picks himself up and goes off on his pilgrimage to yet another holy site. Well, the site that you're in right now is complete. It's real. It's got all of the ingredients that you need. Everything that you need in life is free. And here you are and you've got everything. But we still have that pilgrim mentality. We've got to go someplace to get something. And that's what we mean by progress. Well, guess what? Progress is also a mental concept, but it's also kind of an attitude. Uh, uh, the attitude of making progress is actually the attitude of a loser, the victim, and they're trying to come out of their victimhood by making progress. And we can change that attitude immediately from being uh, a victim who needs to make progress into, wow, I don't have to do any place. The place that I'm in already is holy enough. Let me sit down and enjoy it. This is the concept that most people miss. They think that the Buddha's path is a path of progress and that it's a path of attainment. Many people want things and they see that Buddhism has these words, these labels, and they will say, hot dog, I want that too. Words like Nibbana, words like enlightenment, words like, um, oh, Arahat, Sotapan, um, ex meditation experiences. If I progress hard enough in my meditation, then I'll have a big whip to do experience. And so this is the idea of con of um, progress. Carl, you had a question. I just wanted to add on for me, it ties up into not being OK with existence of simplicity. And we're not essentially like it's put like this. We're looking for problems to solve constantly. So we, we create a problem and then we try to solve it. That's progress. But in essence, we're trying to create uh, a meaning. We're trying to create um, mm -hmm. meaning out of words we perceive in our heads, and then we try to explain them to ourselves. So even with like Nirvana, all these words, we're trying to see what it is. Oh, what, what is this? What is this? Is maybe there's more to life. We're just not okay with this fact that everything is easy. It's simple. Mm -hmm. It's just that uneasiness with same boredom, we say. We were not okay being bored. We're not okay with just sitting. So that's what it kind of entice for me. 
All right. Well, boredom itself is actually wanting something to be different than it is. We're not we don't like what is right now. We will call it hard times. We're bored with it. All right. However, if we recognize that um, the the human mind is actually quite an, uh, a piece of machinery, but unfortunately, instead of being uh, a machine to enjoy reality, our cultures have turned this into a problem solving machine. The human mind is a machine to solve problems. Well, the funny thing is about that is that when we don't have any problems to solve, that's a real problem for a problem solving machine. It's got no problems to solve. So what do we do? We invent new problems to solve because we can't stand not having any problems. And so that's exactly why uh, Buddhism is difficult to understand because the reality is, is that you don't have any problems and you're really not a problem solving machine that we can just enjoy reality, just enjoy life without having to solve any problems. There are no problems, in fact, other than the ones that we manufacture or have been given or we steal from someone. Last week, somebody asked me the question about thinking and thought and where does thought come from? And the answer to that is there's very few original thoughts, almost none. Almost every thought that you think now, you've thought it before. And before that, you heard somebody else telling you about them thinking about it. And so thoughts are actually just repeated the same thing over and over and over again, often in the realm of trying to solve a problem. In fact, there are, there's no problems. So if we can change our attitude about the problems, then there are, are no problems. Also, the idea of making progress is, is that that's a victim's attitude. Making progress towards solving problems. Well, guess what? When you get a problem solved, that just means that you've got to go find another problem to solve because you're in the mode of problem solving. We might think that that's progress, but it's really just getting stuck the same thing over and over and over again. You probably heard about being lost in the woods and people are lost in the woods and they're walking and they keep walking and they keep walking, thinking that they're making progress. And as they keep walking, they eventually recognize a rock that they just saw a few hours ago and recognizing that they're going around and round and around in a circle and not making really any progress at all. And so this is really how people live their lives. They keep journeying, they keep going, thinking that they're making progress and they wind up back in the same place that they were. Okay, so some, some real change needs to be made. And the real change that needs to be made is to change our attitude about things. Yes, Ross, you got your hand up. Um, yeah, thanks, Damarado. So this whole concept when you're, um, you know, when you're at school or, you know, just generally in life where people say you've got to find your purpose in life. That's a, are you saying that's really just a, uh, you know, that's your that's really taking you down the wrong path because there is there is no purpose. Right. There is no meaning to life. There is no purpose to life. That in fact, um, what what we believe gives meaning to life is some sort of authority figure. And the bigger the authority, the higher up in the sky this authority is, then the more we believe in meaning, that life has got to mean something. There's got to 
goal if out there is no if progressing there is no, towards a purpose. big goal pardon but if there is no purpose what are we well meant to, what are we meant to do are there we, is actually a lot of purpose in life and what is the purpose of life well ask whoever's got the purpose people make up purposes they make up meanings of life or they borrow it from somebody who gave them the idea that there's a meaning in life. And everybody winds up being confused because of the various purposes and the various meanings of life. The reality is, is that if you want life to mean something, then make something up. That's what you've been doing anyway. You just make stuff up. <laughs> Carl, you got your hand up again. Yeah. The purpose is a, is, is, is a funny one. Uh, as soon as you say, what is the purpose? And then you answer that there is no purpose. You can see that another question ar arrives in your mind. Okay, so if there's no purpose, then what? And then yeah. what? you're still creating a problem for yourself by having this sequence well, of then thought. what is you the next? You need to snap out of the sequence. You need to look beyond the sequence of these thoughts. And then you can see the purpose of all of it. That's the... That's like a mm -hmm. paradox. I don't know how to precisely pinpoint it, but you can see the questions. If you can see the questions, you can kind of see the cycle. Exactly right. That that's the whole point. That when we say, well, what comes next is because we're still looking for some meaning. We're still looking for some purpose. We're not willing to recognize that there really is no place to go because where you are is already okay. If it's not okay, then all we need to do is to change our attitude about it from it's not okay to it is okay, because the reality is, is that it's okay. That we've been taught that it's not okay. We've been taught that we got to work. And in fact, we've been abused. When we were kids, we were put to school, we were put to work. We did what we were told to do. And then the rich people tell the poor people what to do. This is where the idea of purpose comes from. The purpose is, is to do what you're told to do. Deidre, go ahead. Yeah, so interesting. I think it's really, um, when you say there is no purpose, there's this whole vista opening up, like there's such freedom because you can choose your own meaning or purpose you want, mm -hmm. and then choose mm -hmm. wisely. And like, I'm my purpose is to enjoy life, or my purpose is to connect with others, or whatever. You can choose your own, but that's also like, it's so much freedom that I think that's sometimes hard to grasp. Like, oh wow, everything I've been indoctrinated to. Like, I should do this or be ambitious or have goals or have meaning or whatever. To let go of that, it feels a little bit shaky. Mm hmm It's, it's uh, uh, both thrilling, exciting, and also terrifying to recognize that you don't have those boundaries. That, yeah. in fact, the pilgrim is bound by his pilgrimage. The one who is making progress is bound by his progress. The one who has a meaning in life is bound by that meaning. The people who are problem solvers are bound by their problems. And you want we... some reference for points. I mean, I, I do at least. You want some steady reference points, like this is what life is or something, you know? Mm -hmm. It's the same as I was reading in the in the Sutta 22, like... You, you have a self, you have a not self, self, not self, that, that to look at that, like from uh, this is everything is concept. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, you know, it's a little bit hard to grasp. <laughs> <laughs> but I like it. <laughs> right. For many, many, many centuries, we have been taught that we are not okay. 
the church is given the idea of original sin. You were already broken. Before you were born, you were broken. And your purpose somehow is to one of two things. One is to fix yourself, which then they tell you is impossible. Or the second one is to figure out how to how to get forgiven for being broken while you still remain broken. But it's okay that you're broken. Well, guess what? Broken again is a victim's attitude that you're not broken at all. You've just been convinced that you're broken and need to get fixed. You've been convinced that something is wrong with you and you need to make progress to come out of it. The reality is, is that you're already okay. And you don't need to do anything to make any progress or to solve any problems. You're already okay. But That mentality, that attitude, that victimhood has been so in ground in, so ingrained that we have been repeating that as an attitude over and over and over again, moment by moment, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, that we've actually practiced being a victim, let us say a hundred million times in the past 10 years. So what that means then is is that we have to begin to practice being okay. We have to practice being okay by recognizing those not okay thoughts that we've been practicing already and make a change to them. Like the thought of I'm sick and then say, aha, I see that. I can be sick, but I'm still okay. I'm already all right. Thomas, but, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so um, that just brought me to <clears throat> what I think happened just before I got on this call was that I had an expectation of wanting practice to be easy, practice to feel good, and that kind of created another layer of unwholesomeness on top of that. So I wasn't feeling okay. I wasn't feeling good because I wanted to uh, practice to be like it was before. And then mm. what just happened, somehow it just kind of dropped and yeah, it just all, all fell apart. And now I'm feeling really good. <laughs> all right. Deidre, go ahead. Yeah, uh, because um, um, before you said uh, about um, like you're already okay, but still before that we had about ambition. So I was thinking it still also can be okay to do like a goal setting. I mean, that's there's nothing wrong in it. But I think what you mean to say is that it's not like um, not from victimhood kind of goal setting. I'm sick. I mm-hmm. want to get better. Uh, I have no job. I want a job. I have no money. I want money. But it's more like a goal setting can also be fun, can it? Right. It depends upon your attitude. Yes, that's what I mean. It yeah. certainly does. It always depends upon your attitude. And we have developed the attitude of being a victim to the circumstances. And so we blame the circumstances rather than recognize that it's not the circumstances, it's our opinion, it's our view. Ross, go ahead. Um, the, um, the topic of being sick, so I always find that an interesting one because I, I always feel like the, isn't thought trying to make sense of how you're feeling at that moment in time so if you've like say for example if you catch the flu right Mm -hmm. you're sick so your body feels run down you don't you know you've 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 lost energy and then thought is now translating that experience and and saying you're sick or i'm sick so isn't that isn't that isn't that reasonable for that to occur 
actually what you were saying was is trying to make sense out of things isn't that reasonable the answer right. to that is is that back to the problem solving all right that's back to trying to understand an example, by the way, of that is, is that when I'm giving instructions for people on how to practice Anapanasati, they keep asking questions over and over and over again, one question after another, after another, after another, because they're trying to understand how to practice. Well, guess what? They don't need to understand all of that stuff. That's still just a confused mind. They're still in the victim's attitude of, I need to know more. I need to figure it out because I still don't feel good about it. So this is what we mean by we have to practice changing that attitude to practice changing the state of mind that we're in to gladden the mind. An example of that would be, oh, I don't have to know all of that stuff. I don't have to read every Buddhist literature. I don't have to figure it all out. I can just relax. Okay. I don't have to be afraid of that great big dictionary of Buddhism. I can lay down beside it and take a nap. I don't have to figure it out. You see, the figuring it out is the uh, is the um, um, the method of the victim. Oh, I'll be okay when I figure it all out. Guess what? When you do figure it out, you'll find something else to figure out. And there's no end to the desire to figure things out. What we have to do is to change that desire to figure things out and let how things are be OK. This is a radical idea. It's radically different than the way that we have been raised. And so the way that I would say it is, is that we have been spending our whole lives talking ourselves into feeling bad, giving ourselves duties, giving ourselves problems to solve, giving ourselves uh, um, the desire for knowledge, the desire to gain, the desire to get better. And in fact, we can live our lives just happily doing what we're going to do, already being the winner. And in fact, the best thing to do is nothing at all. Just sit down and relax. There's nothing left to do. You don't have to figure it out. You spend all of this time talking yourself into what you need. And in fact, all of this time you didn't need anything. So now it's time to start talking to yourself in a way that you're already OK. There's no progress to be made because there's no problem to solve. There's nothing to figure out. It's just merely changing your attitude from I'm broken to I'm OK. Thomas, you got your hand up. Um, yeah, so. Uh, really interesting stuff and it kind of it jars against everything I've um, you know considered before is necessary in terms of personal development jars in a good way um, but but still it, it's um, it, it's different what is the role then of motivation uh, because it does take effort right to you talk about right effort and changing mm -hmm. your attitude in the moment um, what is the role of motivation in in ensuring that you'll make that effort and does that coincide with what the buddha says about like skillful desire um, well skillful and, and, means wise wanting okay this is what we're coming to is unwise wanting means that you need it you gotta have it and that i would point this to you as an example is is that you can start or learn to want things that are easily available to you and stop wanting things that are far away. In other words, whatever you want, if it's in within three feet or easy walking distance, then that's OK. You can have the the wisdom to only want things that you can easily get. 
and stop wanting things that are hard to get. So that's the way of looking at it is to take the easy way out. Only desire easy things that are easy to get, like the next breath. If you want to take the next breath, go ahead. The air is there. If you want to smile, that's easy to do. Just smile. But if you want to know all about Buddhism, you're going to be suffering for a long time. That even when you actually figure out the the real thing about the Buddha, unless you apply it, you're going to stay in that desire to want more and more and more. That you start reading, then you read more, and then you start wanting to read the Pali, and you learn the Pali language, and you read more, and then you want to translate the Pali, and now you're a translator, you're a scholar, and you're still miserable the way that you were all along. That in fact, becoming a Buddhist scholar is a curse. Because we're not, they're not practicing. If they would practice correctly, they wouldn't write books. Books are for people who are trying to figure stuff out. And we don't need to figure anything out. We can just relax. We can let those books just lay there. There's no progress to be made. So if you are a pilgrim, get yourself into the holy state immediately and then stop being a pilgrim. And just enjoy the holy life. Here you are. You're whole. Everything around you is okay. You've got enough. I like the word enough. That the word enough actually fits in very well with the middle path. The eightfold, uh, excuse me, the, the, the middle path of the Buddha. That in his first sermon... As he begins to talk about the Four Noble Truths, he introduces it by talking about the middle path. And that middle path solves all of our problems in the sense of where dukkha comes when we're at some extreme or another. But when we recognize that we've got enough, that this is it, you're already in the sweet spot. Things are good enough just the way that they are. Ivan, you got your hand up. Uh, yes, Damarako. Uh, I just have a quick question. Um, is it true, I, I heard that the Buddha himself back then actually disliked the idea of his teaching being written down in books? Something like um, he thinks that works and works on paper are very limited. As in, he prefer talking, like maybe Dharma talk to spread the knowledge rather than through words on paper. I'm not sure, I'm just asking. Okay, you've got some background noise in your muffle, Doug. Uh, Michael, you've got a clear mic. Can you repeat what he said? Ivan was asking if it's true that the Buddha preferred not for his teachings to be written down and uh, that when written down, it can sort of obscure the Dhamma uh, as opposed to having Dhamma talks, for example. Um, actually, I wouldn't say that that would be true. And the reason for that is, is because we've done enough literature search to know that certain works like the Sutta Napata and the Udana were written in the Buddha's lifetime that there are some things that are worth writing down. However, the problem with written literature on its own is, is that you can't ask questions and that book cannot point out to you your desires. That it takes someone who is kind of skilled because they work through their own mind. Once you learn your own mind, the human mind, you recognize they're all the same. Everybody's got a mind. Every, all the minds work the same and they all can have a tweak here and there with the attitude. But a book is not going to give you that. But writing stuff down 
Um, and in fact, in the time of the Buddha, the way that they did it was uh, because writing was difficult. Um, we didn't make easy copies. They didn't have Xerox machines back then. Didn't have computers. But what they did do was that they would chant certain suttas. They would chant it over and over again, and the new students would come in and listen to the chants and then learn the chants and get things uh, in order. And after they learned the chant, then it was explained to them so that they could understand it correctly. That in fact, chanting something and getting it over and over and over again is actually quite valuable. But only if uh, eventually or uh, as you're learning the chants, you also understand what they mean. And so when lay people listen to the monks chant, the monks are getting a great deal of value out of it because they know what the chant means, but the lay people will hear that same chant over and over again, and they still don't have a clue about what it means. And so the same thing is true with a book. You can read the book over and over and over again, but you're going to keep missing the same points over and over again. Your blind spots are going to be there until somebody can point those out to you. And so, uh, Ivan, you're kind of half right. But it's not because of the problem with the book itself. The problem is the way that it's being read. Deidre, you got your hand up. Yeah, I I'm um, referring a little bit for what we talked about earlier, about you saying like the uh, about the right practice and uh, I wanted just to make like a remark that was really um, stunning for me a few a couple of few Sangha talks before where you uh, said or it was one on one where you, this was the first time I heard in all my meditation practice and in all my going to retreats or whatever is that you uh, be aware of what attitude you have and what thoughts you have but then not letting the thoughts go but giving them a counter thought like the opposite thought like i don't i don't feel well uh so i'll then, be okay yeah be a remark okay what what just look what is happening what am i thinking i'm thinking mm -hmm. oh i don't I, what a shitty day or whatever and then you can take an, a counter thought and say it's going to be a perfect day, or it is a perfect day. Yeah, it's already okay. Exactly. All right. This actually comes out of several different suttas. One sutta is number 117, which is the Buddha's really, really clear explanation of the Eightfold Noble Path. And it is completely different than almost all of the other explanations of the Eightfold Noble Path, because most of the time, the uh, the path that is taught is taught by ordinary people in an ordinary way. So I will introduce now to you the concept that there are actually two paths of the Buddha, the beginner's path, the ordinary path, and then that graduates into the second one, the noble path. So the way that, in fact, we do that in, in our culture in a way that when children are raised, we give them rules. So in Buddhist culture, they give the children precepts. Okay. Now, precepts are not the same as rules. It's not the same as a commandment. It's not a law, but rather it's a precept in the sense of begin to understand what it is. Okay. Harming other people. Um, we can we can understand that in two ways. The very ordinary way is, is that the comma machine is going to come get you if you hurt people. But the more uh, noble way of looking at it, uh, the middle way or the uh, the intermediate way would be, oh, if I harm those people, they'll take revenge upon me and try to harm me back. If I insult somebody, they'll insult you back. That's just the way human nature is. 
And then the high level, the really noble position would be, I'm not going to insult anybody because I don't, I don't have any desire to insult anybody. That when you don't want anything, when the mind is noble, then you, you don't take it out on other people because there's nothing to take out. Your, the mind is already clean. The mind is already pure. You don't want anything. Okay. So how do we come to that state is that they start by teaching the children the precepts. And once we have that sila, then we can take on gathering the mind together so that we can have um, uh, the mind together so that we can see clearly. And when we see clearly, then our view changes. So sila is the first one. Now I'm talking out of Sutta number 24. I'll get back to Sutta number 117 in a moment. But in Sutta number 24, it talks about the, the way to start is by getting the sila together. Now, the reality is, is that if you're sitting quietly, just sitting, your sila is already perfect because right then and there, you're not harming anybody. You're not telling any lies. You're just sitting there. Your sila is okay. So as the mind develops, it develops into a quiet state. And then when the quiet state happens, imagine that it's something like this, a camera. And you've seen this a lot on the internets and, and whatnot, that when somebody is holding a camera, it's shaky. But if you take a camera and put it on a tripod, then it gets a much better image. Well, the mind is like that. When your mind settles down, then you can see better. And when you see better, then you begin to understand. Okay. And so uh, having um, from uh, the Siva to uh, the quiet, will then give you the view and the noble view is to investigate, to look, to keep watching. And this is where then we come back to Sutra number 117, that in fact, the noble path requires wisdom to begin with. And so we're no, we're ordinary people until we begin to see clearly. And when we can see clearly, we keep looking, we keep investigating, we keep recognizing that things are always in a flux. If you look at something and study it and come to a conclusion, guess what? The evidence is going to keep changing and your conclusion is going to remain the same. So at one time you were right and you hold the same viewpoint and the same attitude, you're going to be wrong soon enough because reality has changed on you. But if we stay with reality, we're always up to date. But we have to keep looking at things over and over again to stay up to date. And so we have to remember to keep looking. We can't live in our concepts. And yet most people develop their concepts. They develop their worldviews when they were children, when they were too stupid, too ignorant. Children are pretty dumb people. And they stay dumb for the rest of their lives because they keep stuck in the same views and opinions that they formed when they were children. But if we can continue to investigate, can we have the stability to look? And when we look, we can see clearly. And when we see clearly, then we can see these things in our minds that are harmful, that they're unwholesome, that they are in fact hindering us from being in that really great state. This is why they're called hindrances. That in fact, one of the hindrances I think you've heard is called a doubt. What is that? That's the thirst for knowledge, wanting so to know something. And you'll find people in practicing meditation, they want to know all about it. They really want to know and more and more and more and more. And while they're wanting more and studying more, they're not happy. They haven't gotten enough yet. So the question is, when are you going to get enough? Well, 
All we really need to know is to take a look at what we're thinking and make a change to it. Make a change. Any thought that you have can be changed. Any thought that you have can actually be improved. Now, if you find yourself having a really, really super duper 100% excellent thought that cannot be improved upon, at least you then can recognize that that's the case, and then you can congratulate yourself for having such a super duper wonderful thought. So even then, it can be improved. So always recognize that whatever thought that you have can be uh, fixed. It can be better. And so you can begin to congratulate yourself. You begin to look at, ah, I see that. Begin to see what thoughts that you have. This is the real practice. Now, uh, you've probably heard about noting. The problem with noting is, is that you note dukkha, you see the dukkha, you note more dukkha, you see this dukkha, this unsatisfactoriness is connected to that, that one. And now you have a whole group of unsatisfactory things that you've noted. You begin to get buried under all of that dissatisfaction. Some of them even claim that it's a dark night of the soul. In fact, there's no dark nights and there's no souls. But you feel like that you've seen so much crap that you're being buried under it. Well, that's because that practice is missing something. Every thought that we have, every note that we take, will put an additional feature to it, and that's called change, right, noble effort to make the change. Any thought that you have can be improved. Every unwholesome thought can be turned into a wholesome thought. For instance, the thought I'm sick can be changed into the thought of, wow, I ain't dead yet. Wow, I'm okay. I'll, I can survive this. I'll get better. Wow, I can handle this. Wow, I can take the day off. I can lay here in bed and just be sick. Oh, I'm so sick. Oh, I love it. So this is the way that we can change our attitude. Don't be a victim of your circumstances, even the circumstance of being sick. You can change that by changing your attitude about it. We can, in fact, change our attitude. We can change, in fact, in the suttas, it's talked about in the sense of a state of mind. You can change your state of mind. You can gladden your state of mind. You can improve it. You don't have to be victim of your own thoughts. And then, in fact, that's the only thing that you could be victim of is your own thoughts. And so we can come out of that victimhood. Thomas, you got your hand up. Um, yeah, just just wondering, do you then get to a point or can you get to a point where you stop having the thoughts altogether? Is that what? Ah, that's the wrong question. OK, that's a goal oriented. The better thing to ask at this point is, is that can I do it again? Can I do it right now? If I can do it right now, I can do it again later. In fact, doing it right now is a skill that I'm developing and I'll do it really, I'll be fine later. I don't have to want to come to a state to where I don't have any more unwholesome thoughts because hot dog, I can handle this unwholesome thought. I, I, so I, I always understood the practice to be that you, you, you become the observer of thoughts, not the creator of thoughts at some point. So I right. understand that those better. idiots never make any progress. They don't. They become meditation teachers instead. OK, they observe the thoughts and then observe more unwholesome thoughts and then observe more unwholesome thoughts. How about let's observe an unwholesome thought and then change it so that now we're observing a wholesome thought. And can we observe another wholesome thought? And when an unwholesome thought comes in, hot dog, I caught that one too. Let's make a change. 
the Buddha, in fact, had a, um, a little phrase that he used. That it was early in his uh, time when he was at Bodh Gaya. And that little phrase is, aha, I see you, Mara. Aha, I see that unwholesome thought. In other words, we can gladden the mind immediately. And wanting to be gladdened completely is just another unwholesome thought because you're not uh, you're not okay right now. Oh, all of these unwholesome thoughts. Oh, will I ever get rid of them? Instead of, aha, I see that unwholesome thought too. I can get rid of that one too. I can become a winner. I am a winner. Right now, I can handle that unwholesome thought. There's no progress to be made. An instant change is necessary. Wanting to make progress is actually just another unwholesome thought. Carl, go ahead. I think it ties back to the even even sickness and wanting to stop thoughts. It's like if you're sick and you concentrate on the sensation and you just keep your attention on that one sensation of like, oh, my belly hurts then you become that whole thing. You become the whole life in the essence of my belly hurts. But if you allow the sensation to keep passing and you can see that it's moving, if your belly hurts, then you're thinking about something, then you're looking at something. You can see that you're not even sick. You're just creating some kind of reality. Your body's feeling one way and you're creating reality. So in a way, when you say you want to stop the thoughts, you're becoming stagnant. You want to create a stagnant reality when in reality, if you're stagnant, you're dead. If, right. if, if everything was stagnant, we would just be dead. That's the only mm -hmm. way to stop the thoughts. And same way with sickness and sensations. That's the only way to stop sickness is to be stagnant, which means you're dead. Exactly. What you're actually referring to then is, is that we have been talking ourselves into feeling bad all of this time. We've gotten into the habit of talking ourselves into feeling bad. Now is time to change that to start talking ourselves into feeling good. I'm okay. I got this wired. I'm all right. Somebody's joined us. Maloney Alberto. Yeah, can you? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yes, you, you, can you, you called when we're just about to finish this one. We're, we've been on for an yeah, hour. Yes, yeah, sorry. You need to I check your the world time. clock. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> And we still for now, we join next week. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So. This is basically the way that we practice. Now, it's OK for people to go into a retreat, to go into a meditation hall, to sit down in the hall with all of the other people sitting cross legged, squatting on the floor, with an idol or an old monk or something up on the altar along with candles and incense and that kind of stuff. You can think of that as meditation, but then recognize that we're not practicing meditation. We're practicing changing the mind and you can do that at any point in time. Wherever you are, you can gladden the mind, whatever you're doing. But I do recommend that you spend a few minutes intentionally for the next five minutes or so and do this several times a day, intentionally start watching the mind and making improvements, making changes. Start going, getting into the habit of doing this. This is not something that you do occasionally. This is something you want to start doing a lot of. But in fact, when it becomes consistent enough, we can, in fact, put a label on it. This is what the word sotapan actually means. The one who is in the stream means the one who is looking at every raindrop that comes into his mind. Every little bit of water that passes through, he's in it. He can see it. He watches it. He's eager to see what's going on in the mind. I invite you all to become eager to watch what's happening in your mind, to become joyful, to recognize that any, any problem that you have can be changed right then and there. 
that if you're sick, lay down and enjoy being sick. If your butt hurts, sit, stand up and walk around or lay down and let it rest. Most of us will actually sit until our butt hurts and then we'll sit another couple hours because we're busy. We got to get the work done. Won't take the break. Allow yourself to break. Allow yourself to quit. Allow yourself to take your life easy. Stop having goals. Oh, I've got to get 10,000 things done in 10 days. That's a thousand things a day. Oh, no. The only thousand things I need to do today is take one breath at a time. Maybe there'll be a thousand of them by the time I'm all breathed up. But other than that, we don't need to have goals. Take it easy. Slow down. Now, the analogy that I used today with the student was when you're out digging a ditch with the uh, the boss looking on, you see then the boss gets in his car and drives away. Are you going to keep digging the ditch? Or are you going to sit down under the tree? Well, guess what? Why don't you send your boss on an errand? The boss in your own head, send him off someplace so that you can sit down and rest. That's the way to look at it is, is in fact, the boss that we have is that super ego. It's all the rights, rules, rituals that the Buddha talks about. We become obsessed with how things are supposed to be. And then we're in conflict with that because of the way we want it. So we're in conflict with how things are supposed to be, what the boss says, and how we want it to be, and the reality is always missed. So what we need to do is to come out of this conflict between how things are supposed to be and how we want it to be, and come to be restful in how things actually are. Things are good enough as they are. Go ahead, Deidre. Just a little remark I wanted to make. I sometimes talk to my own mind and say, mind, thank you very much. You're very helpful. You're very skillful, but it's enough for now. You don't enough. need to. You enough don't need to for talk today. To <laughs> That's the word that we are to use more of, enough. That you've got enough. We come from a position of scarcity. That's what the victim's position is, is that it's not yet enough. I don't have enough knowledge. I don't have enough products. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough love. I'm looking for love in all the wrong places. And recognize you've already got enough. Enough already. If you want a good mantra, use the mantra enough already. In Thai is Polau. I've got enough. Polau, enough already. The this is enough. It's good enough. You've got all you need. If you start living your life like that, it can become a joy. Everything you've got is you've got enough already. So, does anybody have any last remarks? Wow, what a good crowd. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, thirteen now. That's enough. And so let's end this talk now. I've had enough of it already. Does anybody have any last remarks? All right, you guys have had enough too. Great. <laughs> enough of this. <laughs> had enough. Enough already. Thank you, Damarado. Thank you, everyone.